so it's good to see all of you tonight. I did take the long route. I went to O'Hare first. <laughs> and then it said, you arrived. And he said, are you almost here? I said, yeah, I just arrived. And then I realized I was at Wally Park. <laughs> so anyway, so I did arrive. And I would like to share um, about the monarch butterfly tonight with you. It is. Um, uh, I'm going to be sharing with you the, about the, uh, the monarch metamorphosis and the gospel analogy that is in the life cycle of the monarch butterfly. And I also have some plants and some seeds for you uh, if you are interested in that afterwards. Um, so I am currently serving as the vice president of uh, Creation Science of Milwaukee. We are trying to bring in younger people into our um, into our bodies. So what we've been doing is trying to reach youth groups at churches. And this is one of the talks that we do give to youth, youth groups at churches to get them interested in creation science and in just in the overall ministry of Genesis uh, and creation. Um, so um, who has not marveled at the beauty and the artistry of the monarch butterfly? But monarchs are exceptional in another way. They're the only known insect that is known to migrate. Um, known as the Methuselah generation, these late season monarchs will travel up to 3,000 miles uh, to reach their overwintering sites in Mexico. And when in spring arrives, they make a return trip back. So they just don't go there. They go there, they mate, and they come back. Um, the interesting thing um, is that um, when spring arrives, they return back. And we're wondering, how do they do that? Their navigational system remains a mystery to many. Uh, to man and to science, but it is clearly known to God, our creator, and their creator. So, uh, this is the key verse for this piece. Um, this first was, verse captured my attention, uh, Romans 1.20, when we read that his invisible attributes are clearly seen. My big question when I was uh, first reading the scriptures, and I said, okay, how can something that's invisible be clearly seen? And it goes on to say that it is understood by the things, the creatures that are made. This verse even uh, speaks of his eternal power and Godhead. And so that the things that are made, as some would like to call intelligent design, it's way more than intelligent design because it points to the creator. And in this presentation, I'm going to show you how many things in the analogy that you'll see as we go through the life cycle of the monarch butterfly does point to the creator. Um, and the verse goes on to say this so that they are without excuse. So, uh, wisdom is in scripture, and I think it's really important to continually be reading scripture as a young child and on up through your ages to continue to read scripture because there's so much wisdom. God's wisdom is found in the study of his created things and in the study of nature. There are countless references and comparisons in which we are commanded to observe and study the things that are in nature to glean God's wisdom. So who, can someone tell me who was the wisest man in scripture? Does anybody raise a hand and tell me who was the wisest man? Jesus. Well, Jesus, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in the Old Testament, who was the wi wisest man? Solomon. Solomon. Yep, so yeah, Solomon was the, is known as the wisest person in, in scripture. And um, um, so one of the verses says that um, there's a clear command in scripture to, to study nature. And in my career, I first worked for the military. I, was, uh, um, I worked for the Department of Defense. I was a civilian quality assurance specialist. And one thing that I learned when I was working in the military was that there's a word shall, which they use in a lot of their words in the military. And it's actually a legal term, and it means it will be done. It's not a suggestion. It's not an option. When you see the word shall in any military document, it means uh, it's going to be done, period. And in, we see the same word in scripture. And so when Job says, ask the beasts, and they shall teach thee, he's saying they shall teach thee. So we should be looking at scripture, and we should be looking at things, because nature does teach us. Um, the verse goes on to say, or speak to the earth, it shall teach thee, shall, it shall declare unto thee. So we know from the book of Proverbs, uh, which is 
the book of Proverbs talks about uh, wisdom also. Proverbs 6.6 6 says, go to the ant and observe her, consider her ways and be wise. So the Bible tells us that we can gain a lot of wisdom uh, by observing the things that the Creator has made. And I think when you observe these things in nature, you will find that they point directly to the Creator. Um, so let's get into the study of the monarch butterfly. There is a scientific classification, uh, Dan Danis plexippus. Uh, the common name is, would be kingdom. The, uh, the next, the phylum or class, order, family, and genesis species. So the common name is but monarch butterfly. The kingdom is animalia. Uh, the phylum is anthropodia. Um, I guess I'll put it up over here. <laughs> the class is insecta. Uh, the order is lepidoptera. And the family is uh, Danaidae, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing these right because I'm mostly a reader. And then the genus species is Danis plexippus. So that's uh, that. And it appears that Solomon had been reading scripture and he knew of the admonitions that were written in Job 12, 7 to 8, because Proverbs tells us that Solomon was inspired by the book of Proverbs. And um, the book of Proverbs to share with mankind the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs of Solomon tells us it's wise for us to study things of nature and to apply those things to your daily life. One such person who did this was actually a colleague of mine, indirectly, and his name was Jules Por H. Poirier, and he's the only one. I'm going to show you his book. Uh, this is Jules's book. This is the only, only Christian book on the market on the monarch butterfly. And actually, it's out of print right now. And I've been working with this family uh, to see if we can get it reprinted. But this is the only Christian book that I'm aware of on the monarch butterfly. And so who was Jules Poirier? He was an AIG speaker. Uh, and he was also a senior design engineer for military programs that we both worked on. So I was working indirectly for NASA. I worked for the Department of Defense for uh, Delco Electronics. Uh, Delco, which is in Wisconsin, made the guidance system for the Apollo. Um, program that sent man to the moon and it continued to work on the navigation systems for many military products of which I inspected many of these things. I did first article inspections for the senior um, engineers and Jules Poirier was one of the senior senior engineers and I didn't even know I was working for him <laughs> uh, indirectly because my reports were going to his desk um, but he was a senior design engineer and he was in Santa Barbara California and I was working where I was working on inspection aspects in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So later I worked for the Department of Defense and I worked on, because of my work with uh, some of the programs that I was on, I worked for the Challenger Space Shuttle investigation team. I worked um, concurrently with NASA and contractors and engineers when the Challenger blew up. They needed people to inspect all of the paperwork and the material and that was one of the things that I was assigned to. And Jules Poirier also worked on the same navigation system. He was a Christian man, and this man clearly applied scripture to his work. He was fascinated with navigation systems, and he was also fascinated with the monarch butterfly, so much that he wrote a book when he retired. So this is me years ago. I worked, turns out that Jules and I were working on the same project in another capacity. Uh, I was working for the Memory Assembly for Military Navigation Systems, um, and I, too, have been fascinated with navigation systems. One fun fact is that this is, a, this is the navigation system that sent the Apollo <laughs> to the moon, by the way. They were inhibit lines. We used cores that would sh be shaken into uh, various uh, formations, and then we would actually sew, like a sewing, uh, the inhibit lines. Um, and that's actually, if you think of your phone today, people have eight megabytes or eight, eight uh, gig and 24 and 64, eight kilobytes is what sent man to the moon, eight. Mm -hmm. And they had to um, do it, uh, um, 8K, and yes, I said K, uh, that's what sent man to the moon. So core memory was, was before solid state memory existed. It was before flash memory that we know today. And in between, there was a thing called bubble memory. And those are the type of things that I worked on. That is me in the picture <laughs> in my younger days. <laughs> so um, so his, Jules' book, uh, he wrote a book on the navigation of engineering. Um, 
uh, his book is now out of print, but it's my prayer that his, print, his book would be reprinted. I learned of our work in connection um, and passion for monarchs uh, later when I was doing research on the monarch butterfly, and I was trying to meet this gentleman. I traveled to uh, California because I was doing research on the monarch butterfly in California, and um, I had missed him by a few months. Uh, he had passed away at age 91. Um, I am currently in contact with his family, and they have currently given me rights to all of his research work on the monarch butterfly, all of his writings and everything. So I'm very excited about that. Um, so he also wrote another book for children. It was called uh, uh, The Life and Adventures of Monarch, uh, Monar Monica the Monarch. Um, you can f These books are out of print, though. You can find them if you Google them. I mean, this book is like $4.95, something like that if you could still get a hold of it. so, But we're trying to get him to go back and reprint. And um, Jules Poirier books, uh, his, he was really fascinated with complex design. And he addressed, and how he started in what he was doing, he, he starts his book that he addressed some of his engineer friends. And this is what Jules said. Today I would like to present to you a fascinating proposal for an optical lens and an electrical navigation system. And the requirements are as follows. So his requirements were uh, that um, the lens system should be able to see in all directions simultaneously. It should be able to see all colors of the rainbow and ultraviolet light. It should be able to detect objects as small as 0.04 inches and as large as 10 feet from a distance of 1 inch to 20 feet. Uh, the light from the lens should be... Uh, converted to electrical voltage pulses whose magnitudes would be A, proportional to light intensity, B, a max amplitude and voltage of only 20 millivolts, and C, delivered to a central computer. This is what he presented. So he was a Christian man, and he was using these things to present to his scientific fellows. Uh, and this was for the navigation system for the Apollo. This is what he was talking to them about. So um, he went on to say that the sensors must detect uh, directions from all Earth's magnet magnetic field at a position of the sun. The CPU must be able to calculate the input of info from the sun's position and the Earth's magnetic field to determine its presence <coughs> and position to an ac accuracy of plus or minus 100 feet. And it must be capable of directing its navigation pilot to a new location as far as 3,000 miles away to an accuracy of plus or minus 100 feet. <laughs> so that's what he had presented. Um, other requirements, he said that the system must be designed to weigh less than <laughs> 0.5 grams. The system must be smaller than a pea. And the system must be so designed that it can be built in eight days by one person in total darkness without any outside help. <laughs> so that was quite a challenge. And he, this is what he said to the engineers. He said, I challenge you. Uh, students, engineers, and managers, they all laughed at him. They said, well, you know, you've got to be kidding us. Who could design such a system like this? And Jules told him, I'm happy to tell you and to inform you that this optical system has already been designed. <laughs> and it's been manufactured in mass production. <laughs> The design is found in the monarch butterfly. So let's look at the amazing uh, flying machine that we can all call a monarch butterfly. And I, I think it's just amazing that, that he saw that, and that's what went into his um, engineering of the Apollo system that sent man to the moon. This, is, this was one of the senior, senior uh, engineers for that program. So the monarch egg. The side view is 0.039 inches of a diameter of an egg through a microscope. The monarch butterfly is an enchanting, brilliant, multifaceted diamond gem. The figure above shows from the base to the apex, there's about 20 vertical arched uh, crystalline ridges, similar to the construction of a cathedral dome. Um, so I think it's beautiful. Um, the egg stage is three to five days. If the weather is warm, the caterpillar exists in the egg about three days. If it's a little cooler, it'll perhaps stay in there for five days. Um, note, like the, like the snowflake, the butterfly 
species has a different detail in the egg. The 0.039 diameter uh, is about the size of a pinhead. Or if the students are writing on a piece of paper, when you put your period at the end of a sentence, that's about as big as what the egg, the size of the egg is. So, and so that's what it is. It does have a cathedral structure about the size of a pinhead. Um, the female butterfly lays from about 400 to 800 eggs and contained within the egg is the entire genetic code, not only the blueprint for the caterpillar, but also for constructing of the butterfly, uh, as well as the program to direct the butterfly in all of its generations, because it is a multi-generational um, insect, to travel uh, thousands of miles to a different location. Um, so it's pretty, incri pretty crazy, pretty, pretty neat. So I look to the scriptures always, and when I first, start, I first started doing this, I'm a homeschool mom, I was homeschooling my kids, and that's where I, we decided to raise a modern butterfly. And as I was raising it, I came up across that first scripture that I told you about, uh, Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. And my first, my first question, as just someone who studies the Bible, was how can something that's invisible be clearly seen? And it really boggled my mind for a while. And so I started looking more and more into the scripture as we were studying the life cycle of monarch butterfly. And these verses just kept coming to no end. And so I've started to, I'm writing a book on it, um, have that in process. So uh, First Peter tells us to desire the pure milk of the word. Upon emerging from the egg, the caterpillar is about 2 millimeters long, and it weighs about 0.55 milligrams. It begins its life of eating, eating, and eating. First Peter uh, tells us to desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And actually, as we study the word of God, as we study the scripture, we actually mature and grow in our faith. Um, and that's, that's what the word of God is all about, is he helping us to grow and mature. Um, the caterpillar, the monarch butterfly caterpillar, it actually doubles in size every single day. So it comes out of the egg, and the first day of eating, it will double its size. The second day of eating, it will double its size again. The third day of eating, it will double its size again. So imagine if your child <laughs> was born and was maybe about, I don't know, what are they, seven and a half, eight pounds, and they, day two they were 16 pounds, and day three they were 32 pounds. Uh, that's what these guys do, so it's amazing. Uh, monarch caterpillars will only eat uh, milkweed. They only eat the milkweed plant. And there are actually, um, they, start, they won't eat any other plant because the, their digestive system is made to only digest milkweed. Um, this is a common milkweed that you see here. Uh, we have some seeds on the table if you'd like to uh, look at some of them today, or you can get some seeds if you'd like um, later. Uh, this is another type of a milkweed, which is called swamp milkweed, um, and you can see a caterpillar on there. Amazingly, there are over 2,400 species and 220 distinct genera of the milkweed, and the caterpillars can eat all of them. So, um, The most common are the two that I've showed you, which is common milkweed and the swamp milkweed, but there are a lot of different types. As I did study of the monarch butterfly, I traveled all over. I, I've done classes in pretty much all 50 <coughs> states on the monarch butterfly. I did some research work in Florida. They have swamp milkweed down there, and it's a, like a slightly, it's not the, it's a different type. I spent uh, three months in California looking at the overwintering sites in California, and they also have a different milkweed type out there. In Wisconsin and the Midwest, the most common that we do find is the, um, the one that we saw before here, which is the broadleaf. But the swamp milkweed is also here. If you, you, know, uh, if you look around, you will find it. So milkweed, uh, you know, in scripture and everything, there's always mimicry. And there's even mimicry in the milkweed. So there is another um, type of weed. It's called dogbane. And it's very similar to, uh, to the milkweed plant. However, if you go on the underside of the, the stems, it would be red. So what I teach kids when, or people when they're wanting to raise monarch butterflies is that uh, green for go. And if there's red on the underside, it's dogbane. And I've had, <laughs> I've had lots of caterpillars where we did classes and I had maybe 
300 kids in the class, and I gave them all a sample of, we went to a place where there was a field, and little did I know it was dog bane and not milkweed. <laughs> and um, so I told them, oh yeah, I'll take, take, a, take a piece of this because you're gonna need this you know, to raise your caterpillar at home, and they all died. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I learned through uh, the process, because I, I have a, a number of uh, resources that I work with who are entomologists, and an entomologist is a scientist who specifically studies insects. And one of my favorite entomologists is here in the state of Illinois. And I've done a lot of work with them. In fact, they've helped me out quite a bit. It's Dr. Uh, Jeffords. And he is, um, I, have one, I have several of his books. I have the Illinois books. Uh, he has done a lot of work on it. And he's a good friend of mine. Um, so uh, as far as the red, what will happen is the underside of the leaf will be red and the stem will be kind of reddish. Late in the season on the standard uh, milkweed, it does get a red tinge on the top in the vein. It's still milkweed. We're talking about the underside of the leaf. If the underside, the vein on the underside is red, then it's dog vein. So you know your stuff. So uh, the caterpillars, when they uh, are born, um, they're itsy bitsy, they're really tiny. So a newborn babe will grow. Um, they are hard to find when they're this tiny because they are so teeny tiny, but the Lord has given a tip to you, and I'm going to share it with you today. The gospel, he always points to the gospel and everything, and he does it in here as well. So the, the caterpillar is so tiny, and my vision is like when I'm out in the field and it's sunny and you're turning over all these leaves, you're trying to find a caterpillar, it's, it's easy to, over, to miss them. But what the telltale sign is a C, C for Christ. Mm -hmm. So the newborn caterpillars, they will always eat a C, and I tell the kids, I'm sure sharing the gospel, C for Christ. The grayish and white color of the black uh, head of the caterpillar easily blends into the leaf itself. Uh, so if you look for the C for Christ, you'll find them. And that's how, that's how my students find them. They'll go out and they'll look and they'll see little, little nip marks like that. Um, and it's amazing that there is a complete gospel analogy in the life cycle of the monarch butterfly complete down to the blood of Jesus Christ. It's all there, all of it, and the work that he did on the cross. So um, another thing is that they're smart. You know, they talk about intelligent design, but this is way beyond intelligent design because intelligent design never points to the creator. And people who are really, um, really know the scriptures and know things of science, science always points to the creator. And so in this case, see for Christ, it is an intelligent little caterpillar because if he would eat around the entire circle, he would fall through the leaf. <laughs> so see for Christ. <laughs> so um, they do grow. Um, a 14-year-old caterpillar is about two inches long. Um, and note that the bo body is now decorated with an elegant yellow and black and white stripes. It weighs about 1.5 grams. And this weight is 2,700 times more than when the caterpillar first came out of the egg. So um, there would be, that would be for a six pound baby to be growing to about 16,200 pounds in 14 days. <laughs> so no other class of animal does this that we know of. This is the only class of uh, insect on the earth or animal on the earth that matches this fantastic growth in such a short amount of time. Um, and just imagine if you doubled every day, so. I'm watching my diet plan. <laughs> so, so there's a little tiny one and that's how big they grow. Um, they're very pretty. Um, they're very pretty. <coughs> so uh, for the biology folks and the science people in, in, in the room, uh, here's a drawing of uh, what the inside of the caterpillar looks like. So the round prolegs are tipped with suction cups, um, and that's how the larva actually stick to the surface as it walks on the milkweed. They have a locomotion um, is the principle or task of the prolegs. There are five pairs of prolegs. Um, uh, two, there are two in the, in the hind that are actually called claspers because they're like hands and they clasp onto things. And then there are six front or true legs uh, that are usually ma mainly used for eating and for uh, the shedding of the head capsule. And I actually have samples of the head capsules in little plastic bins when you walk over there, you'll be able to see one. Um, this is the head of a mature caterpillar. Uh, three simple eyes on both sides of the head. There's a spinneret. The silk pads are spun by the caterpillars. Uh, they vary in size depending on the material to which they're being attached. 
that again is way beyond intelligent design because that creature can tell when he's going to finally do his last transformation, it can sense, it knows what the material is that it's attaching to and it will adjust its own uh, spinneret and system for what the material is that it's attaching to. Um, I have some samples over there that you'll see where uh, I put them in a cup and I use a mesh. I'll um, show you that later. Uh, they attach to that and you can actually see it if you're raising them at home because the, the uh, formation of the thing that they use to attach is different and you can see it physically. And then sometimes I'll put sticks um, in a cup or different plants and then they will attach onto that and it, it's different, it's, it's a different um, configuration. So we're going to go into the amazing gospel analogy in the life cycle of monarch butterfly. Um, the, uh, the monarchs, they grow by shedding their skin. As we said, that they, they double in size every day and at some point they're going to like bust right out of their skin. They get so big that they can't, they can't continue in the skin. And that is what happens to them. But for um, the, the thing that the picture that I saw from scripture was that the skin had a sin analogy because Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And God tells us that uh, if we don't shed our sin, then we will not be able to enjoy life in Christ with, uh, with our Savior in heaven. And shedding your skin or shedding your sin is a, it's a, it's a way of maturing as a Christian. You don't just come out one day and you know, just say, I'm not going to sin in this manner anymore. It's a matter of uh, studying the scripture and maturing in Christ. And then you know, eventually you, you will give all your things up to Christ and he will help you get through those things. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the things that I would share with the kids is that the, the skin that they come out of, and I actually have samples of it sitting over there as well, it looks like this black, balled up thing. And I talk to the kids about what does God think of our sin? Well, the Word of God tells us very clearly in the Bible that it's ugly, and he uses other words <laughs> more specific than ugly. He calls it, you know, like dung. Um, that's what he says about our sin. And so... Um, and I will ask the children when I'm teaching classes because they'll be able to see all these examples and sometimes we can even see the caterpillar come right out of the skin and then I'll say, can that caterpillar ever crawl back into that again? And they will look at me and they said, no, no way. When they actually see this in nature, they'll say, there's no way that that caterpillar could crawl back into that old skin. And I said, and so it is with us. If you truly repent of your sin, you'll never go back. You'll be done. And how many of us, I don't know, a lot of different churches, a lot of different denominations, um, they'll have people come up to the altar maybe or s repent in some way, um, and then <coughs> two weeks later they're, they're back at the confessional again or they're back at the uh, confessing their sin again. What it comes down to is they, they, never, they, they didn't give it up to God completely and they did not actually repent. Repent means turning away from your sin and you won't ever go back to it again. And so that's what God is speaking of in the scripture when he tells us about that. So, how do we mature? And this is, again, geared toward my younger students that I teach. You grow in wisdom by, uh, by reading God's word, um, turning away from sin. <coughs> I guess it could apply to everybody, I guess. Uh, and the true repentance means that you won't, you're not going to sin in that way anymore. Um, our, our, thing that we always look, our person that we always look to uh, in the scripture is Jesus Christ, <coughs> and that's our model. Jesus was sinless, but um, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. And for people, and for young people especially as they're growing up, um, if they are leaning towards things of wisdom, and they will gain favor with God and men. Um, and that's, that's by owning up to things and walking away from sin. So, um, back to uh, First Peter, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. For us, that's like reading the Bible. So we should be devouring the Bible every day like food. Um, three meals a day. <laughs> that means that when you, read, uh, when you read, you will grow and mature in the Lord. Um, so I encourage everyone to always read their Bible every day. A lot of people nowadays get into the habit of they go to church on Sunday, maybe Sunday evening, you know, and that's like, you know, and then they go on Wednesday night maybe for an, a vitamin or an extra supplement. But really we should be in the Word of God every day. Um, have worship time in the morning. It's very important. Um, for young people, the Word of God, or for everybody really, God is constantly telling us through the scriptures to choose the right path. 
And um, in Proverbs 23, 19, he says, um, listen, my son, and be wise, and set your heart on the things that are on the right path. Um, and he also admonishes of us of what is the wrong path. James 4, 17 says that, uh, therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So, and these are things that are gained through reading the scriptures, and it just comes alive to that these things will, will come. Um, also, again, the, the, the topic that sin is ugly, and here's where I say, can that caterpillar crawl back into that skin? Can, can it? Can, do you think that caterpillar can crawl back into that skin? No. <laughs> so um, so it, the answer is resounding no, and so it should be the same with us, uh, because to him who knows something that is sin, then we must do the right thing and turn away from that. Um, and in all that we do and all that we say, we should be seeking uh, the glory of God for his kingdom. Um, again, doing what is right, even a child knows by his deeds whether what, what they do is pure and right. Um, so here's the life cycle of the monarch <coughs> butterfly. It does start with the egg, very tiny, and then goes into the larva stage, which is the caterpillar stage, then it goes into the pupa stage, which is also known as the chrysalis, and then it comes out into uh, the monarch butterfly. Um, okay, and then what they do is once they come out as a monarch butterfly, they're completely changed in the inside and they migrate to Mexico. This is uh, a picture, and this was amazing to me. Well, we've been tagging and releasing butterflies and how I started to teach more and more about it was we tag, um, I tag usually anywhere from 200 to 400 monarchs a year through classes and through where I teach classes. And um, some years back, one of ours was recovered in Mexico, and here they sent me a picture of a little Mexican child holding a butterfly with our tag on it. And I was like, wow. <laughs> you know, and so that really kind of jump-started uh, the teaching and to go out and share that. Uh, monarchs also migrate to, uh, it, there are different overwintering sites and we're learning more and more about it. Uh, monarchs migrate also in, they go to Mexico, but they also go to other places. Um, there was a time when they thought that the, migra the monarchs from California did not migrate to Mexico, but now they're finding that they actually do because they found some tagged, uh, some tagged specimens that came from California. And California has its own s story. California is like that part of the, United States that some people think should fall off and not be part of the, <laughs> part of the, part of the states. They're, they think differently. Um, I think in the Midwest, I, I'm a conservative person politically, and uh, California is very liberal in a lot of ways. Um, one of the things when I went and did my study out in California there, I went to uh, 27 uh, overwintering sites and counted, and we're talking. I would share all the time, oh yeah, we tag them, and they're like, you tag them? I said, yeah. They said, you, you actually touch them? I said, yeah, you hold them like this and you stick the tag on like this, and they're like, it's against the law to touch them in, in, uh, in uh, California. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. And they said, you can get a $50 fine. So how many did you say you tagged? 200 or 400? <laughs> That's 50 bucks a, a, a piece. I was like, wow. And so they were very adamant. They, they consider it a protected species, which can be a plus and a minus, but at the same time, um, they don't take their butterflies out there. Now, more recently, they have some organizations have pushed that they do tag for research purposes, and those are the ones that they have found that do actually migrate to Mexico. Um, so they go on a missionary trip, which is pretty incredible. The other thing that's incredible to me is that they leave as an individual, like all of the butterflies that we've had, where students maybe had one or two of them, and they'd release the butterfly from their backyard as an individual, but then we know that they gather together. And in Hebrews uh, 10, it tells us, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So again, pointing to Christ and everything he points, everything is pointing to, to, to scripture. In Mexico, um, the monarchs come in by the millions. They darken the sky, they arrive in October, and they stay until May. Um, I have been wanting to go there. I tried to go there earlier this year, but couldn't uh, make it. But um, Lord willing, um, uh, I was recently contacted by another organization that I'm going to be doing talks for, and they want a documentary done with photography and some artwork. And they took, I've been photographing all of my specimens that I've done, and so they just did an animation where they used um, my photographs to actually uh, create the animations properly for them. Um, so, 
Here's some pictures in California. Uh, like again, they have no tag and then they have fines. So some of these places they call them, um, uh, you can go, and those are monarch butterflies. They look like dried leaves up in the top. Um, and like some of the places that you'll go, they'll like tell you, take your shoes off. You, you, you know, and I'm like, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to uh, irritate the butterflies. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, they're, they're acting like it's holy ground, but actually. Right. <laughs> uh, so interesting. So they, you do see signs like that. They'll tell you, don't talk, um, take your shoes off, those type of things. Um, so again, we already talked about the butterflies that it's, well, actually, it's a, not a 50, it's a $500 fine. It's if you touch a monarch, you can get fined $500 in, in California. Just for touching one. Mm -hmm. So they seem to elevate the things of science above man. And when you find signs like this, you know, take off your shoes or walk lightly, you know, I just think about how God put man in control of all the animals yeah. that he told us that we are to, to, um, to, to be the ruler of the animals. Um, and we're not to be in submission to animals, but rather they are in submission to man. And so he gives us that. So here's another place <coughs> in California. Um, it's called Natural Bridges. Um, very nice. It's a, it was, this was one of the nicest places to go to. There's over 300 wintering sites in California. Um, and I, like I said, I visited 27 of them. And also they keep talking about uh, why the California migrants uh, California monarchs do not migrate from Mexico. Some say that there is, the, there is a mountain range, and we do know that monarchs are very sensitive to temperature. Um, they will, they, if, it, if you go high up in the mountains, they do, um, uh, it's cold. But also, I didn't realize this when I started studying more and more in Mexico. Mexico has mountains and they have snow, and it gets cold where the overwintering sites are, and there's actually ice on the ground. They have, I'll show you some, I, Hopefully I have the pictures in here where they go down in the morning and they uh, look at those. So, um, so that's that. But in California, um, they talk about the, one of the things that I just recently read uh, this month was from Monarch Watch, which is an organization, which is a very, um, it's a secular organization, but they do do a lot with monarch butterflies. But they're very much into global warming. They're trying to um, address global warming through the monarch butterfly. And so they say that the, the numbers are down. They even had a, um, uh, when, when uh, Mr. Obama was president, he did a, an executive order uh, to plant milkweed all along the highways. And that was primarily through the uh, Monarch Watch uh, organization where they got him to do that, to plant milkweed. Because years ago, um, there was, a, milkweed is, it's a weed. Um, and I used to do classes all in Wisconsin. I would just go down to the lakefront and I knew where all of the monarch, big patches of monarch were, um, milkweed was. And I always, I knew the season, so I would always know if I could take a, take a class of 30 kids or 15 kids down there, we would always find some caterpillars. And then one season I went down and there was no milkweed. It was all mowed down. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, hey, what happened to the milkweed? Then I couldn't find any. Um, this was, again, I've been doing this for about 20 years, so this was about 15 years ago or so. And um, what they did was there was a, some law that got put into effect that said that we, you, mil milkweed was a noxious weed and they had to mow it all down and they got rid of it. I actually got a ticket for $75 for having a milkweed in my backyard because the, <laughs> the milkweed cops came and they were like, <laughs> hey, there's a, you have milkweed in your backyard and it was like higher than six inches. And I said, well, yeah, it grows five feet you know, about the size of me, and they cut my milkweed stuff down. And then, so Monarch Watch does have some very, I mean, uh, environmentalist people, they do have a purpose in life. One of the things that they did was they got milkweed to be planted. They created way stations where people can have milkweed in your backyard. And they kind of, and it was taking away the, um, the habitat for the monarchs. And so, so they did address that, so I, I give them credit for that. Um, California, uh, doesn't always count and I went and I went to these 27 different sites and I was counting and one of the problems was it's a matter of how many volunteers are involved. So we visited Natural Bridges which was one of the most populated uh, sites and um, basically their data that they're using I consider it to be very skewed data because it's not reliable. It's citizen counting and you can go online and look they'll have citizen counting of um, 
which is kind of fun for us to do, but it's not reliable data because um, it's, just, it's just not a way to do scientific uh, reporting of things. Um, so um, there is mimicry in everything, just like there is uh, in a lot of different things. The monarch butterfly um, uh, does not, it doesn't have an extra ring on the bottom. And a lot of times in mimicry and in things in faith, you know, there's always those faiths where they add something extra to the scripture, like they add extra things or, or add extra things that people need to do to become saved. And, and it's not, it's mimicry is what it is. So the viceroy is another butterfly that has an extra black rim on the bottom. So it's something added in. They look very much like the, the, the monarch, um, but they're not. They have an extra item added in. So it's kind of like, you know, adding something to the gospel. Um, they also, uh, there was some words that said that uh, the monarch was, is poisonous and the viceroy was not poisonous and new research now shows that the viceroy is also poisonous. <laughs> and that comes from your very own here from Illinois, Dr. Michael Jeffords. He's the entomologist, he's a PhD entomologist uh, lead in Illinois. And um, he's been studying monarchs and he came up with that research by actually studying from a scientific perspective. So they are both poisonous. Um, so we're gonna get into the metamorphosis and this picture here is, um, I took this with Dr. Jeffords in, uh, in Illinois. Um, I bring my specimens when I ha would have, I wanted to get some really neat pictures of the inside of the chrysalis and that was because um, Jules, my friend Jules, he took pictures of the inside of the heart of the monarch butterfly and I was trying to re create that and redo that. And he obviously had some really um, incredible equipment that he was able to use to do that. Um, so I, and I now have rights to his, I have his photographs. So, yeah, so I'm very excited about that. But um, I went down to the University of Illinois Champaign where Dr. Jeffords work, works and um, we did some work on photographing. And it's to me, I mean this picture, we lit it and everything, but it, you can all, actually see like an aura of life almost to me. It looks like that is the chrysalis. Um, here's what a chrysalis looks like when it was just made, just formed. So it is, um, it's like an emerald green color. This one was just made, uh, just created within a few seconds. We took this picture. So um, they look even more beautiful as they, they go on. Um, but some of the things of scripture are that there's a cream master, which is a sink, silk button. And cream master to me, the word is cream master. That's the technical scientific word for, or maybe it's the non-scientific word. That's what they call it. The cream master is the little piece that the caterpillar hangs on when it goes into its last transformation. And to me, it's like a two, like a double word, cree and master. So to me, it's like creation and master. Uh, Jesus was um, the master of all. He's the Lord of all. And so I do see that symbolism in there. Cream Master is also a triangle-shaped silk button. So the, the symbolism of the Trinity or the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, is pointed to in, this, uh, in, in science, in the uh, nature. And then also, um, I look at it as true faith because when the caterpillar, they go through five instars, and instar is where they shed their skin. And the very last one, always before, there was another exoskeleton underneath, another skin underneath, and they just kind of crawled away and went, hey, I can eat more now, <laughs> grow a little bigger. Uh, but the last time, it's different. So the last time, they will actually um, uh, make this cream master, and again, they're intelligently designed way more than intelligent design because they'll make the cream master design it for what they're going to hang onto, the material they're going to hang onto. And then they hang there. Um, they hang there in the shape of a J. And so there's, there are verses in the Bible that say, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here's the, the caterpillar, and it is actually, it hangs in the shape of a J for about nine hours, maybe a little bit more. Um, and they're just incredible in what they do. And for many years, I had been uh, watching and uh, raising monarchs to the, uh, cat to the monarch. Thing. And so many times I had seen it go into the J and I always missed it actually doing its transformation into the chrysalis. And I so much wanted to see that. This is back in the day, I mean, I've been doing this 20 years, so back in the day when we didn't have the nice cameras that we have now, um, I would study it very closely. I'd, sometimes I would stay up 
you know, all night just to try to see, just to try to get a glimpse of it. And finally one day I did, and when I started studying more, I saw telltale tips that I tell my students. These, this is what you look for so that you don't miss it, like I did for many years. So one of the things is there's a scripture in the Word of God that says, be still and know I'm God. So they do hang in the shape of the J, and they don't know what's happening next. Um, they just, they're, before, when they would shed their skin, it was relatively quickly. They would just, uh, it, their skin would split, and they would come out, and there's another um, exoskeleton in beneath it. Now this one, what happens is they actually, um, I have a little arrow pointing to the antenna. The antenna will swizzle up like a swizzle stick right before, within 10 minutes before it's going to transform. The antenna will do that. And they will also do another, uh, if you notice on the other one, the, um, on the caterpillar it looks like it's sweating. Um, and they do that, beads of sweat will come upon it and it'll look like it's sweating. It does an another amazing thing, it'll take its, um, uh, the true pro legs are here, there's six of them, and it will go like this, and will actually look like it's praising God, because it'll open its arms, it'll open its true legs, and it'll bow its head, it'll keep going like this. And what it's actually doing is it's trying to split the skin in the back, but it's going through this motion that looks to me like prayer or praise. Um, so it's a, truly amazing, so I, to me it's pointing to scripture. Um, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane uh, said to watch with me, he told his uh, disciples he was going to go up to pray before he went to the cross, and he told his disciples just watch and pray with me. He didn't want them to fall asleep. He wanted them to watch and pray. And so that's what I tell people, that when you see it doing this, watch and pray because it, within one hour, or usually 15 minutes, it's going to make its transformation. And it is a tremendous struggle, tremendous, because you will actually see the sweat beating up on the caterpillar and the antenna will swizzle and unswizzle and you'll see like uh, drips of liquid coming off. So it's, it's an anguish uh, when it's doing this. Is he in the chrysalis? Uh, uh, that is a caterpillar and it's about to go into the chrysalis. Oh, it's about, okay. So, and this is the principle of dying to yourself. It'll drop down and you see the, the pro legs at the bottom, they're stretching out. And if you're watching this in a video, you'll see it looks like it's praying. It'll be either clapping its hands, putting together, it'll be bowing its head. And then within, um, they transform from the inside out. So and it happens very, very quickly. This is less than, uh, well, it's about 10 minutes when you see those swizzle stick things that I was showing you, the, the antenna. And then it'll split and within four minutes, it'll be like this. And then within, um, a few minutes of being like that, it'll, um, it'll look just like the beautiful chrysalis. The other thing that happens inside is that everything, and there's different scientists that think about different things. Some of them say, oh, it all goes to mush and it's like, you know, liquefies and it's like, like it was at creation, you know. <laughs> right, you know and, but that's not true because Dr. Um, uh, Jules, he actually photographed the inside of the chrysalis with some very detailed photographs. And what he found is that things do, there are genetics inside and things are changing. And they're obviously, it's like the inside of your body. There's different things going on. If you looked at the inside of your body, it wouldn't look like what it looks like on the outside. But the heart uh, is the only thing that stays intact. Everything else <coughs> changes. Um, and it's, it's just incredible in what it does. So it is a major heart change. And that's what it is in the gospel for us. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it's a heart change. You change from the inside out, and God has a way of changing your heart so that you have a different outlook on life, and you accept him as, uh, it's what the gospel is in a nutshell, is a heart change. Um, so the chrysalis uh, stays in the chrysalis stage for about 9 to 14 days, and again, that depends on the temperature. Um, so this is, again, the one that I had that was very... This one just went into the chrysalis. They, I have maybe some other pictures that they look more beautiful because the gems on the bottom, there are nine golden gems, and they look like gold. They look like pure gold when you look at them. So then the, uh, they will, it'll continue to be green, and it'll start to turn more and more dark. And again, that principle of dying to yourself is there. And right before it's going to come out, this is an image of a chrysalis right before it's going to emerge. And I can show you some things on there why you know it's going to merge is because there's this little shape here 
which over this is the same shape here where it's smooth. And right here, it, ha it gets, this expands right here. When that expands, this loosens up, and then it's about to, ready to come out. So that's uh, what happens there. Um, so, so that one is just about to come out. And it's amazing how they do come out is um, you'll see right in here in this area, um, it'll start pushing out and it'll, this will separate here. And that's how you see that they're coming out when they come out. Again, they come out in less than 30 seconds and it's easily missed. Um, there's a golden braid on the top edge of the chrysalis. And when I talked to people about the monarch butterfly, I said, as in life, you have choices. And accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is a choice. So the golden band, there's gold on the top and then white and black. And so the symbolism is there even in nature that you can take the right road that leads to paths of gold or you can take the wrong path. You can make the wrong choice and it is your choice. Um, so that symbolism is there. This is a picture of one of them when they hit, you can see the golden gems and the gold, they look like pure gold. When you're looking at these with your naked eye right in front of you, it looks like pure gold. It's beautiful. And, um, and also there's nine of them. So there's a lot of scripture that speaks of nine things. One of them is uh, Galatians, the fruit of the spirit. There are nine fruit of the spirit. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. And again, these are things that happens with people that um, when we become Christians, we don't automatically have all of these fruit. As you're studying and maturing in the Word of God, you develop this truth, this fruit. Um, I know a lot of people that are Christians, and I don't think they fully enter joy, uh, understand joy because I know a lot of Christians that don't really truly have joy. Um, so I think that's something that we, the more you read scripture, you can mature to that. And also self-control is the easiest one to point to because what little child has self-control? You know, they're like, mine, <laughs> give me that, that's mine. Um, but that's something that you learn as you mature uh, in life and also the other things as well. So um, fruit of the spirit is literally built in. So in here you can see on the tip there the gold and actually the gold the golden um, things on there, what they actually do is they meld right in, right when it's coming out, so that on the shell of the chrysalis, the shell that's left, those ones, the nine parts that are on the chrysalis itself, they become incorporated, weaved in as a fabric of the butterfly. And they're no longer on the shell. Um, but the ones that we looked at before, the gold and black rim is still on the top. And so that's inc incredible to me. To me, that's saying we do have choice in life, and you can choose the right choice or the wrong choice. But in either case, those that are coming after you are going to know your choices, mm -hmm. and they're going to know uh, they're going to. If you're a Christian, you could have a generation of Christians come after you. Um, that's a very amazing thing. So here's a video. It's going to show you. It emerges in less than 30 seconds. What it looks like. It's um, it just starts splitting, and it'll just come out. Uh, the, cat, the beautiful butterfly will come out. It takes less than 30 seconds when that happens. Um, and it's just an amazing thing to see. Um, so the next one uh, is that within 10 minutes, their wings expand. So their wings are all crumpled up and small. And then uh, they will start to pump, uh, I believe it's like a blood-like uh, something into their wings to make them expand. And here's where this is incredible to me. This is where it just drove it home to me that things of nature point to Christ. And here it is, the complete gospel analogy. Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is, there is no, um, without the shedding of blood, there, there just is no, no reason for Christ to have come. He died on the cross for us. And this monarch butterfly will drip. Two things it'll drip. It'll drip a blood-like substance, and then it'll also drip a liquid, like a clear liquid. And when Jesus was on the cross, uh, they put the spear in his side, and he, he was already dead, but then the liquid came out. And both of those things are symbolized in the life cycle of monarch butterfly, which I think is truly amazing. Um, this is the side of the wing. This is where the water is dripping out of the side. And this is something that I've been showing some of the um, entomologists, people who... This is something that I've been sharing with them. They don't really, they have not seen this because we have been tagging the monarch butterfly 
and we do put the tag on the butterfly wing, and I think, I think that the veins of the butterfly are actually uh, ways that they breathe. Um, I'm not sure. I, I would, when I saw the, the blood coming out, this, the, the moisture coming out this year, I've kind of reevaluated if I'm going to tag anymore because I know <laughs> that they do go to Mexico and, and I don't, and when you go to Mexico and you see the millions that are in Mexico, it's like a, uh, a pin in a haystack for how many would actually be recovered there. I think, I don't know about their data exactly. So back to uh, Hebrews 9.22, it says that according to the law, almost all things are purified that, through the blood and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And that is symbolized in the life cycle of the monarch butterfly which to me is just beyond amazing. It's God pointing to things of nature to point to himself. Um, so the gospel in a nutshell is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose on the third day. Uh, Christ bore our sin on the cross. He paid the price for us. And what happens when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior? We then, the word of God tells us that we will be able to share eternity with Christ in heaven forever and um, we will be beautiful new creatures. And that's what the monarch butterfly is. It is a beautiful new creature. And it is so different. It's not crawling around like a worm on its belly and working and doing all of those things. Now it's enjoying sweet nectar uh, from flowers. And that's how it is with scripture. The more I matured and started reading more and more of scripture, um, there are times when it is like sweet nectar to me when you read the word of God. And I'm sure you've all experienced that as well, that when you read the word of God, it it can be like sweet nectar to you, uh, to build you up in, in your, your faith. Um, the, but, the monarch butterfly does have, uh, it's a glorified new body. Therefore, if any, anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Very, very clear in this uh, insect. And then the other thing is that we live in a tent. Um, so the chrysalis, the, the outer shell of what the butterfly comes out of, it looks to me actually like a tent. And I have shared this message with a lot of people over the years, and I've had people in their 90s. Um, one gentleman, he was in his 90s, accepted the Lord because his body was falling apart. And when he saw this, he was like, wow, maybe I should accept the Lord. And I talked to him about the Lord and opened up the Bible, and he accepted the Lord. So the things of nature are mighty to the understanding of Christ, um, and I think that we should be studying those things. Again, glorified new body. They're eating sweet nectar. We tag and release them. We stick a sticker on the side. You can actually see the actual stickers over there when you take a look. Um, here's what they look at like. Uh, we stick them on with a tweezer. This one has an identification number 94. Uh, it's got an 800 phone number on it. It has an email address on it. <laughs> and uh, you just stick it on there and let them, f you release them. Um, they're over there. You'll be able to see one uh, in person. If you take a walk through our displays over there, you'll be able to see one. And this maybe gives a, uh, you can hold the butterfly for the first 24 hours or so when they come out because they can't really fly because their wings are not completely dry. And they're really interesting because they have like a personality. They'll sit on your finger. It's really neat to get pictures of kids to hold, hold them. Um, you can see kind of the size of the tag to the finger there on this picture here. Um, they're very intricate, they're, and they're very intricately designed. And, and again, the, the construction from when they had everything that they needed from the caterpillar when they went through the metamorphosis, all of those changes were pre-programmed in, which is a total thing that there's no other explanation than Christ uh, to, to share that. Even look at their... Their uh, appendages, they have, two, they have little V things, they stab into the milkweed to determine if it's the right plant that this should be on. They, they use that to determine uh, the, the flower, if that's the flower they should be eating. Um, so a lot of different things. They do migrate. This is millions of them. I don't know if you can really see mm -hmm. in the greens, but they're in there. Um, they kind of camouflage and they come together by the millions. Um, North America, we live in the continent of North America. Mapping skills is a thing I teach children. Um, this is not accurate because if it went a direct route, it would be 852 miles, but we know that they don't take that route because we know by the tagging, the, the, we get tag uh, recoveries. Um, so what they actually do from 
I live in Wisconsin, you guys live here, but what they do, the Wisconsin ones, they come down this way. There's mountainous peak around here. They come and they bank along here. They go down to Florida. Some of mine have been recovered in Florida. And then they go across the bay. They go across the water. Um, some of them do come across the way on the land, but we do know that they go across the bay on the water as well because we've had people that work on the oil rigs and the different things and they found all these butterflies were on their little uh, floaty things out there. And also air pilots have seen these dark clouds coming at them. They're like, what is this? And then when they get closer, it's a whole bunch of monarch butterflies flying so that they know that they fly uh, that way. So the antenna are very interesting. Some scientists believe that the antenna can sense um, the tides and the temperature and different things, so they're very intricately designed. Um, the monarch migrations um, in North America, they do fr come from Canada all the way down. And there's like a line on the top where they're not up farther. The only reason is, is because milkweed and the flowers that they feed on don't grow above that point. Um, so they're following their food source, for one. Um, the other thing, this line here, people might wonder, well, what's here? Well, who's a geology person that can tell me what's right there? <laughs> Mountains. The, the Rocky Mountains are there. The Great Divide is right there. Um, California is on the other side. <laughs> so, but there are monarchs in California, and um, so this is where they've been tagging. Again, Monarch Watch, they only tag during certain seasons. They won't even allow you to have tags, so they're only, like, I wanted to tag all your, the early season, too, because they're saying just the last season migrates, and I said, how do you know? They said, because we know, and I said, well, do you tag them in the, because they're going to start coming around now. Uh, as soon as the flowers come, you'll see monarchs. And you, how do we know where they go? How do you know where they go unless you tag them and you're tracking them? So anyway, Hebrews 10.24 says, assemble ourselves together. Uh, forsake not the assembly of yourself. They, somehow they do that. Um, they leave as an individual and they get together with millions of other ones. Um, just briefly, the predators, there's lots of bad guys. Uh, the paper wasp, um, spiders, aphids, ants, assassin bugs, uh, ladybugs, the new Japanese beetle that's eating up everybody's garden, uh, and flies. Flies are very, very uh, negative to the, the caterpillar. Um, so they will eat the caterpillars and they will do different um, things to them. And then the good guys, when you're looking for monarch, on the, in the monarch patch, if you see um, a longhorn beetle, which looks like that, um, they're friendly. They're friendly to monarchs. So if you find those on your monarch, on your uh, milkweed, you'll probably find caterpillars on there because these guys eat the other guys. <laughs> so. um, and then the scales, they have a very intricate uh, scale structure. I have some uh, samples over there that you can look through a magnifying glass and look at that. I used to bring a um, microscope, but I didn't bring it today. Um, and then my website is monarchadventure.org. I have a lot of this material is on there. Um, I also have pictures from Dr. Jeffords on there, which he is from Illinois, and you should really check out his stuff. He went to, um, to Mexico, and he did some uh, photo journaling there, and he's got incredible pictures. Um, and then that's it. So thank you very much, and we'll be open for questions. And there's displays you can look at.